are live. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. It's been a long time. I hope everything is great with you all. We have a great guest today. His name is Carbon Mike, founder of the Foundationalist Society, also a writer and podcaster. Carbon Mike, welcome to the show. Thank you, thank you. Oh, it's Foundationist. No, Foundationalist. Foundationist, sorry. (laughs) Jesus. Uh, That's all right. (laughs) (laughs) Just tells me that, and then I screw it up anyway. (laughs) Listen, so few people know about us that it doesn't make much difference anyway at this point. <laughs> well, hey, this is what it's all about. You know, we, you know, we, you find people in the same sphere as you, and, you know, I think it's all about helping right. each other out and getting, getting the message out there, that's and that's right. what it's all about. That's exactly it, yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. So I'm glad to have you on because I get a ton of good vibes from you. We've been corresponding through emails. Um, and I think it's hard to find people who are willing to generally go through the issues without being offended or throwing accusations at you for exploring different ideas. I just I find I find that you're on that that level. Well, thank you. I mean, it's funny. Uh, I've been um, you and you and I probably do the same thing, kind of like yelling at the internet when we see when we see some of these exchanges between people where. I'm going to ask a legitimate question. It's an awesome question, right? And instead of actually answering it, um, people start yelling and screaming. They, you know, they go into a whole routine and they put up their pearls and swoon, what have you. And that was, that was one of the things that kind of really turned me off. I mean, I used to be up the left years ago, and that's one of the things that turned me off is that mm-hmm. people would people would ask you questions. Maybe sometimes the question was even asked with, a, with an offensive intent, but there would be really good answers that you could just, Give. And you know, people just—I I found a lot of a lot of potentially fruitful conversations got hijacked, and, and, I, and um, I, I'm I'm always kind of disgusted by that. So. Yeah, it's, I mean, I, I feel the same exact way. I find that, and we'll get into the, uh, the more, more of the details behind that. But yeah, I find, and that's kind of like the purpose of starting this podcast was kind of just to freely explore ideas and to not, you know, I mean, it, it comes from this this idea that you can't. You shouldn't talk about religion or politics or what are the other things? You can't talk about stuff like, oh, Thanksgiving or uh, yeah. Christmas. And I just reject right. that entirely. I think you should, be yeah. able, you should be able to talk about these things, especially among your friends and like even people you meet on the street. I don't see a reason why, like if someone disagrees with you, that they're all of a sudden your, your enemy right off the bat. That's correct. That's it's, correct. And, and I think, look, I think that, that whole, there's all these little uh, kind of platitudes that people say, like, you know, don't, don't discuss religion or politics and don't do business with your friends. You know, so all that is bullshit. I know the <laughs> language restrictions are, but you, you let me know. But, you no, know, it's so like, this is, this is exactly, you know, we need to mix it up just like this. And if we argue, we argue, and that's fine. But, mm-hmm. you know, this, this kind of, uh, uh, this kind of attempt to kind of sanitize the public square and to kind of put up uh, rounded corners on all the, on all the things that, that, that really matter to human beings and that therefore are going to be maybe troubling and disturbing. You know, we got to lean into all that stuff. So yeah, I'm with you there. Absolutely. So I discovered you on Gavin McGinnis's network, Censor.tv, where you were discussing uh, issues involving black Americans with Milo Yiannopoulos. And, you know, he's very famous. We all know Milo is very intelligent, very well read. He has a little bit of insight into the culture, given uh, well, to some degree, given his immediate family. And when you combine that with his sassy wits, uh, it makes for a pretty interesting and substantive conversation. Looking back at it, was there anything, any point that you wanted to make or anything you wanted to clarify or maybe even your feelings about the conversation? Well, you know, here's the thing about my book. I've been, I've been following him for a while, like, you know, following his content that is like looking at his, his appearances. Uh, way back before he became really kind of this superstar, he, he, it, it's almost like it was less interesting, you know, uh, when he became a superstar. But um, mm-hmm. you know, I remember some of these, some of these kind of now famous appearances. You know, that uh, that uh, the thing he did, Paul. I think it was DePaul University, where these uh, I suppose the LM people stormed the state age and you know made, made fools of themselves. Mm-hmm. Um, I used to watch him on uh, on BBC. Um, there were there were some kind of talk series on BBC mm-hmm. where he'd show up and kind of battle feminists, and that I always got a kick out of watching him do that. Um, so you know, I think look like a lot of conservatives. Um, 
I think he's right on some things, um, but he's, he's um, how can I put this? I think his perspective is a little bit skewed, and we can get into that and go into detail, but essentially, mm-hmm. you know, he's, it, it's almost as if, so what's good about Milo? What's good about Milo is that he doesn't, he doesn't, he's not afraid of standing toe-to-toe with his adversaries and trading punches. That's mm-hmm. excellent. Yep. Okay. Um, what, what's not good about Milo is that I don't think he has another gear other than occasion. And sometimes, mm-hmm. and it's, it's, the, the, the thing about provocation is that it's a tactic. It's not a, it's not an end in itself, right? So, mm-hmm. you know, you, you you provoke someone so that they, for example, you can provoke an adversary so they don't make a mistake, right? And you can capitalize on that, or you can provoke someone to get them to think. But, but the end goal is to get people to try to line up on something and to try to convince people. And, and the thing is that if you're not, not, to me, if you're not convincing. You're losing, you know. And if you say this is a cultural war, if it's a cultural conflict, whatever you want to call it, you know, culture, agriculture, cultivate is a common word there. It involves growing things. Mm-hmm. And in a culture war, if you're not growing something, you're losing. And so I think, um, I, you know, I, I like I like how he spends all the people I hate into fit. That's wonderful. <laughs> but I also kind of I, I'm also reflective enough to understand that like that's not good enough right now. You see, we're not going to get the far left. We're not going to necessarily get the people running out in the street um, making a nuisance to themselves, mm-hmm. okay? But we might get the people who are sitting on the fence. And there's a lot of young people, I think, there's a lot of young people who are just now coming into them, their sense of themselves, you know? And like all young people, they're kind of dumb, you know? But, <laughs> but they got a lot of energy. They got a lot of ideas. Yes. They want right? to do something a lot of passion, and, and that passion is a natural resource. And, you know, part of the problem, you know, I think the root of a lot of the problems we've been having is, one, of course, that the people in charge of the institutions that are supposed to shepherd these young people along and kind of channel that energy and, and discipline it and turn it into something that is a useful instrument for society, those people, they've been hijacked by stupid and dangerous ideology, and they're more, they're worse than useless. I'm talking about people running universities and, and, and what have you. Okay? Mm-hmm. But the, the other problem is that on, on the right, see, we haven't stepped up and, and really figured out a, a, a better narrative to tell, you know, to, to, to kind of pull those kids away from the other side. So what mm-hmm. I mean is, okay, I know that BLM is full of it. You know the BLM is full of it. You know, mm-hmm. I know that Antifa is full of it. You know they're full of it. Mm-hmm. But the problem is that just because they're full of it, that's not necessarily going to be the thing that convinces people on the fence or young people who are trying to figure out, you know, to come over to your side. You're going to have something better than that. Yep. And so the, the conversation I was having with Milo, the argument I was having with Milo, was kind of a, uh, was, was a version of kind of about that as it applies to black folks in particular. Particular, right now, um, and, and my, my basic contention was that black people, black Americans, okay, and we, and of course, we're not counting academia, we're not counting journalism. There, there are separate breeds. But Absolutely, about, like, even young breeds, people, I would people. say, are a different class, you know, right. among themselves. A different, exactly, and they're not really a political center of gravity. People with families and homes and businesses are. Yes. Of yes. People with property. Okay, now. And my argument has been for a long time, black folks are naturally conservative, okay? Mm-hmm. Why? Because they have a natural skepticism of government, because at one point we, 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 we lived under a situation in the country where domestic terrorists were in fact running the American South, okay? And they were aided and abetted, aided and abetted by government. We have a natural skepticism about, about this. We don't think that the state is kind of automatically righteous. Okay, mm-hmm. and at the same time, you know, uh, it, it is definitely the case that that from from the uh, from even before the end of slavery to the present day, you know, black folks have understood very well the importance of self reliance, education, um, excellence as a weapon, true excellence as a weapon, and the necessity to kind of to kind of figure things out. And, and do it for yourself, because for a very long time, we didn't have any allies in Washington. You know, 
we, we, yeah, there were, I mean, even, look, even Abraham Lincoln, Abraham Lincoln called the meeting of black leaders and, uh, and said that, uh, basically told them, said, listen, this is, you know, we think slavery is an abomination, but that doesn't mean we think you're equal, <laughs> okay? Mm-hmm. You know? So we've known, um, and that, that's not, that's not a, a knock on Lincoln, that's just, you know, it's history. By way of saying that, the political the political landscape has not been one that, that that's been kind of like a, a continuously friendly. And look, that, that's normal. I'm just saying that this is why black folks is the deep strain of conservatism in, in black folks. And, and I know we're going on for a bit, but the point here is that I think the Republicans have really done themselves a disservice. Maybe conservatives more generally have done themselves a disservice in the way they talk to the black electorate, the way they try to get black people to, to come on side. There's plenty of good reasons not to vote for the Democrats. But that's not good enough. You have to give me a good reason to vote for you. And one brief example is, you know, the, the, the kind of the ugly and stupid kind of plantation rhetoric mm-hmm. that Republicans are always breaking out when they talk to black folks. Don't do that. There's plenty of good interesting things to say to me about uh, about a smaller government footprint, about lower property taxes, about the importance of, of, of home ownership, about the importance of this, or that, or going to trade school, or whatever. There's all these great arguments to make. Why is it every time these people open their mouths, they have to see what they have to say, either plantation, mm-hmm. or their other favorite word, Jesse Jackson now shot. Because <laughs> it's not good enough. And that was, that's kind of the point I was making. And that, that's a microcosm of the larger point, which is that we have to have a better way of, of bringing people on side uh, and, and, you know, in order to push back against the lunatic club. It's not good enough to just say they're lunatic. That's obvious. What next? So, I'll pause. I agree with all that stuff. Um, in order to get, in order to, I think, to make stuff happen, you know, you need to be a multi-tool. You need to have multiple options and different ways of talking to people. And like you said, I mean, I, I think everyone on the right loves to see some of the more radical lefties, you know, foaming at the mouth when they're, <laughs> you know, when, when he talks to them. But at the same time, it's like, OK, that's fun and all. But if we want to get beyond that, if we want to start like maybe changing people's minds, we have to have a different approach to, to how we talk to them. Correct. And Correct. Correct. and yeah, and it's 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 and, and it's, oh, go ahead. No, I'm sorry to interrupt you. I was going to say this is. I mean, this is a thing that causes me kind of endless frustration. And it's one of the reasons, one of the handful of reasons I started the Foundationist Society in the first place. Because, um, again, there are all these good arguments flying around, and no one's using them. No one's picking them up. And, and by the way, you know, as much as, as, much as the, 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 you know, the crazy the lefties, you know, like to go on, uh, about racism and, and uh, as, as if racism defines everything, which of course it does not. At the same time, I have to be honest, it's like there are p- people on the right who have kind of, who, who take a kind of, kind of glee in talking about black people in a certain way. And now that doesn't, you know, contrary to this nonsense, kind of critical race theory bullshit, it's like that doesn't harm anyone except conservatives. <laughs> you know, it's like, it's yeah. like, it's, it doesn't harm me when, when people make snide comments about IQ or snide comments about this or post dumb racist memes, you know, with, with dumb images of, 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 of low character black people doing stereotypical things. It doesn't hurt me at all. But first of all, I'm, you know, like, you know, I'm a grown man. <laughs> I'm a working man. You know, mm-hmm. it's like I have, I'm, I'm a part of the economy, you know, and I know I'm the shit. So <laughs> it doesn't affect me. But the problem is we're not, again, our goal ultimately is not to provoke. Our goal mm-hmm. is to get people on side, and and you know this is this is really important. So you know, the, the way there's a handful of things. I remember years ago when I started, um, I started uh, before I started doing the YouTube stuff or Twitter or whatever. I was posting on this um, on this, uh, this this chat service, a kind of a comment service, really called Discus D I S Q U S, and I post as Carbon Mike. Back, back when uh, I found the Atlantic at least tolerable, actually back before Tennessee Coates became a one-trip pony because he used to uh, you know, write regularly with the Atlantic. Mm-hmm. And, and um, I used to get into what I thought were very interesting discussions with um, conservatives on, in the comment section for some of Coates' essays. And you know, the thing I would always be coming at them with is, well, 
hang on a second. How come more, you see, more, I think more black people should vote Republican. I mean, why don't they? And then, and then they say something like, well, it's because that, 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 that. And it's like, oh, so I'm gullible is why I don't vote for you. In other words, is that your pitch? Mm-hmm. <laughs> is, is that your way? And, you know, it's like, hi, I think you're stupid and gullible. And that's why you should vote for me. No one tells, no one tells red staters, no one tells white red staters to get off, to get out of the meth lab, for example. Mm-hmm. No one tells them that. No one tells them to get out of the trailer park, because you know why? That's a, a stupid and ugly insult. Okay? Mm-hmm. So stop telling me to get off the plantation. Tell me something interesting. I'll give you an example. For the last few decades, for, for almost as long as I've been, been alive, the Republican Party has had a, a real hard on for organized labor, and not in a loving way, okay? Mm-hmm. Now, I'm not saying that organized labor is, is the be-all and end-all, and everyone knows that there is corruption in labor unions. And we know this, we wouldn't even have to look at current events to know this corruption in labor unions. Labor unions are human institutions, so of course there is corruption in them, okay? But listen, very many black Americans, okay, people with families and, and, and real productive jobs and homes and things like that. Very many of those people came up in organized labor. So if you're a conservative party, okay, and you want to make traction in that demographic, you have to find something better to say about organized labor than that all unions are terrible and they got to go. I'm sorry. Like my dad was, you know, came up in, in, in the construction union, mm-hmm. okay? And it's like, all these union brothers, I guarantee you, man, I guarantee you these guys are staunchly conservative. Mm-hmm. They don't want to hear from no Republicans, though. Because why would they? The guy wants to destroy. If, if, if every Republican you hear from wants to, wants to bust your union, no matter how corrupt it is or isn't, they just hate unions. Why would you vote for them? Why? <laughs> you see what I'm saying? And, and, and so people mm-hmm. say, well, you know, and then. Then, again, you want to insult people. You want to say they're gullible. You want to say they're stupid. I always go back to this thing. When, when Obama was president, he said something about um, how people in red states, uh, because of this or that or the other, they become bitter and they cling to guns and religion. Do you remember that? Oh, yes. Uh, the bitter clingers. Right. Yeah. Okay. A bitter, bitter, okay. Now, how long... Now, what year was that? Because we're still, when I, when I go to the American Conservative uh, a magazine online and I read Rod Drager's column, he still uses that term, bitter clinger, mm-hmm. okay? In other words, he said, and listen, I'm not defending the fact that he said it, he shouldn't have said that. Sure. But my point is that, you know, we never heard the end of it when he said that one thing. Now, mm-hmm. every goddamn time Republicans open their mouths, they have some stupid thing to say about black people. And we're supposed to just swallow it and, 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 and throw our vote into the GOP camp? No, I'm sorry. Ask me respectfully. Yeah, Ask let, me uh, respectfully. Oh, absolutely. Even I would go even beyond that. And it's like, even if they're respectful, no, you should be voting for someone based on better policy ideas. Um, and, you know, things that are in your self-interest. And for me, like as, as a real conservative, I would say, you know, what's left of the constitutional conservatives out there, uh, I think the winning message is inalienable rights, liberties, limited government, really specific government, back to the Constitution, yeah. and letting people, you know, yeah. assume their proper place as being their own sovereigns, as people who Correct. can take control of their own lives. And you know what? For better or for worse, you know? And then, you know, uh, promoting a culture that uh, they will fe- that will kind of fill in the gap. So if people fail... And they run into hard times. Then you have, you know, your your community. You have the church. You have, I mean, all these other safety nets that are all. all none of this is all government related at all. This all could just come from the people if we had that kind of mindset. If those kind of values were taught to people. Correct. So I'm with you there. Let me give you. Let me give you some nuanced pushback because I like. I like. Uh, I like everything you're saying, but I want. I want to kind of put that in a, in a larger uh, or in a different frame, right? Sure. So let's let's talk about so you said constitutional conservatives, right? And and I really like that mm-hmm. because I really do believe you know that that the, the Constitution is one of the things that makes us that makes America a genuine nation, yes. right? Not just a tribe, 
you know, wrapped up in a flag with its own currency, right? Yep. <laughs> you know, you can go to Europe and you can find plenty of countries that are like that. They're just tribes, you know, <laughs> wrapped in a flag mm-hmm. with a currency and some, you know, additional whatever. No, we are an actual nation. And that, and that, that really means something to me. I'm, I'm sure it means something to you too. Okay. Absolutely. It's, it's now, a nation ideas as opposed to like identity or race or tribe or any of that stuff. It's, it's, it, we're a nation surrounding the ideas of liberty around these uh, enlightened ideas of John Locke, Charles de Montesquieu. Um, you know, it's, and it's, it's unprecedented and in no other nation in the world is grounded in, in those kinds of thoughts and ideas. That's correct. I think, I think you, you might, you might argue that, that uh, Great Britain, Great Britain comes very close. Um, and Absolutely. And it kind of makes sense given, given their origin, given the Magna Carta and what have you. Absolutely, but, okay. yeah. English Bill of Rights. So, right, exactly. And, and we, uh, we could give the whole thing about the, the first charter of the City of London and how that was you know, based on you know, William the Conqueror's respect for the fact that they were a, a, a commercial enterprise you know, and, and they were not to be messed with. But I, I want to zero in on what you said because, okay, so constitutional conservative is one of the things that I was kind of beating up on my low for as well. Okay. Every time there's a school shooting or any kind of you know, l- large mass casualty shooting, right? we have hysterical lefties screaming that it's time to take all the guns away. Okay. We're very used to this. Mm-hmm. And thank goodness we have a critical mass of people who have the good sense to say, hey, n- no. Because the Second Amendment says what it says. Okay? Mm-hmm. Now, the same conservatives who are so staunchly, uh, uh, excuse me, who are such staunch defenders of the Second Amendment when it comes to the Fourth Amendment, now all of a sudden they claim, oh, why is that? I'm, I'm talking specifically about the, the, the so-called conservatives who are all in favor of stop and frisk mm-hmm. yep. as a matter of public safety. Okay? Now, again, you know, and I wrote about this on my blog. I think I may have even sent you the, uh, a link to it. But, you know, I said, that, listen, it, you know, the point about stop and frisk is not that it's racist. That's an argument you can have about it, but I don't care about that argument. Mm-hmm. As a black person, I don't care. Stop and frisk is a bad idea, primarily because it is not policing. It's not policing. It's throwing meat at a problem instead of throwing actual, you know, thought and, and effort at a problem. And, and it violates the Fourth Amendment to the Constitution. Now, how come? Mm-hmm. So, again, we're trying to, you know, conservatives trying to convince people to come on side, trying to convince, you know, black folks who haven't voted, you know, a, 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 for a Republican candidate since who knows when. Okay. Mm-hmm. And, and by the way, that's gone back and forth. People think that black people have always voted for Democrats and, they, and they, you know, people want to you know, tell me about the, about the original Democratic Party. Like, I don't already know, you know. <laughs> like, I'm stupid. But like, yes, I know what the original Democrats were. But, but I'm not going to just go on the name of the party. People every year, every season, every decade, people are going to look at the landscape and figure out who, what the party that, roughly speaking, is going to like not mess with my interests too much. And people, mm-hmm. you know, black folks are like any other demographic. We look at our interests and we make a decision. Okay. But what I'm saying is, if, you, if, if, if Republicans feel that they should be trusted, if black folks should trust them, right, and both of them, well, then you have to show you're trustworthy. And if your conservatism is, is, is kind of is wobbly in that way. You know, if you're inconsistent in that way, you know, you have this, it's, it's like, I, I need to see a party that really, that believes what it believes all the way down. Mm-hmm. That is to say, if you, if you believe, if you're a constitutionalist, can be, then, then if, if you like the Bill of Rights, you got to like all of it. And even my, I was shocked when I went up with my, he said, well, you know, with the fourth amendment, who cares, you know, really? Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. Then. But then, but then don't turn around. Right. So, you know, okay. Yep. That's what you think. Right. But then don't turn around and say, yeah, I'm a strict conference because you're not. You're not. That's all. Well, yeah, I don't. I don't think he. Yeah, I don't think he claims to be a constitutionalist. I think he's kind of more of a provocateur, just on the right. I mean, I don't. Well, but yeah, but I mean, he's 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 said a lot about the Second Amendment and how it's very important that you know Britain does not have a Second Amendment and and look at the situation there. And 
mm-hmm. it's important. And you know, so in other words, my, my point is that my point is that if you if you if you value these things, you gotta value them with some kind of consistency because people are watching that. You know, I'm always I'm always talking, talking to people about rights and always saying that one of the one of the one of the, the, the ways in which um, Black Lives Matter reminds us how far uh, um, politics has fallen in this country is, you know, the, the their kind of coarseness and ineptitude and and uh, and incompetence in the realm of activism reminds one of how good the civil rights movement was at its job. Okay, these guys mm-hmm. were experts at brand management, at optics, at finding the right moment, at choosing their enemies, at finding the transcendent moment, okay, and exploiting that transcendent moment, okay? Mm-hmm. Now, um, because why? Because they understood the same thing that I'm telling you, that, that, that we're trying to convince people. And when, when black folks dressed in their Sunday best, to do what Antifa would call a direct action, but which really meant walking across a bridge, for example, you know, mm-hmm. on and on, singing, singing uh, Sunday hymns. They were doing that for a reason. And the reason was so the people sitting there, it wasn't so they were, were going to convince Bull Connor that black people were just dancing. You know, I'm not going to convince a guy like that. Mm-hmm. They did that to Convince the, the woman sitting at home, the housewife in, in Peoria or, or, or Jacksonville or whatever, who's looking at a television. And what you're saying, wait a minute, you know, they're singing the songs I remember from when I went to church as a kid. And they're all yep. dressed in this Sunday. That's why the, why the police writing them down and beating them and, and setting the dogs on what's going on. Yeah, absolutely. I'm trying to convince people. In, in politics, if you're not convincing, you're losing. And then so, it, by the same token, it's like, you have to convince me. And I'm not, you know, I, I, I am convinced of, of, the, of, of the greatness of this country. I'm convinced of her potential. I'm convinced of, of the importance of the eternal things. You know, I'm convinced of the importance of family, of virtue, of all those things, of, of, of the solidity, of, of the kind of the, 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 the rock of Christendom that these civilizations really stand on. I'm convinced mm-hmm. of all those things. Mm-hmm. I'm not convinced of the Republican Party yet. And that's, I mean, you got to compare yeah. in that. It's not good enough. And that's, that's beautifully said, and I agree with pretty much all of that. Um, Let me ask you this, because I I find that the argument that, that, well, look look at how, like you'll say, well, Republicans, they insult, they have this message, uh, the, the, you know, the Candace Owens classic message of uh, slaves on a plantation, um, among the other things that's going on. You have Brandon Tatum, who is not really popular in the the black conservative community. Um, So the, the, the point is, is that these people are trying, you know, I think their intent is to, is to change minds, but they're not getting the results that they are desiring. And, and I think the reason for that is you've kind of explained it as others have explained to me is that it's so insulting that it, it almost makes them want to vote for the other guy. Even if that other guy is, he might even be worse, but at least he's not saying I'm a slave on a plantation. And I really relate with that because I, I mean, I mean, we all remember the late John McCain, who he would come and when he would when he would campaign uh, back in his state, he would be this staunch conservative. And then when he would get to Washington, everything changed. And now he's got to be he's got to appeal to the cocktail party crowd. He's got to get you know, he's got to work with the Democrats. He's you know, he changes his tune entirely. And that's very insulting to me. It's like, well, you just like, what do you think? I'm stupid. But at the end of the day, I just for me, it's hard for me to understand even if the Republicans are bad and they're insulting this and stuff, aren't the Democrats still objectively worse in terms of their self-interest? I mean, the, I had a friend put it to me this way, is that either way, right, or at least right now, if you vote for either party, you're getting the same thing. You're getting more tyranny. You're getting more socialism. And the, you know, the only choice you have is do you want it faster or slower? And those aren't great choices, but I'm always going to pick the slower of the two. I mean, Trump is not fantastic, but he was much better than Hillary Clinton, in my opinion. So it's it, it, you see what I'm saying? Like, like, I'm also insulted, but I still will actually vote for the right. But why is that not the case for most black Americans, in your opinion? I, that's, a very good, that's a very good question. So let's take... Um... By the way, it's interesting. You said the Trump being better than Hillary. I'm not a Trump fan, but I I, I think Trump. I'm, I'm increasingly coming to understand Trump is a even 
even to compare Trump to Hillary is a category error because he is he is a she is essentially an administrator and he is essentially a disruptor, right? Mm-hmm. And and believe it or not, I think that like you know we kind of needed a disruptor right about now. <laughs> so, <laughs> agreed, but, agreed. You know, uh, but, but uh, I want I want to get to that in a second. But okay, you pose a very good question. So why? Is it, well, a, a couple of things. Let's go back. You know, you, you were talking about. Um, I was talking about organized labor. Well, that's one very important thing. Mm-hmm. If, if you organize labor is what has enabled very many working class people to have a working class slash middle class existence. Now, this is especially important in the case of black Americans. Why? Because contrary to some of the conservative hacks that battle the lunatic left, but, but make a good point by pushing it too far. We do, in fact, have a form of, there, there is a form of structural racism in the United States. Um, it's not where the left says it is, they're full of it. Um, but it is in, for example, housing law, right? Because why? Because, because housing is a very long, it's probably the most long-lived, longest-lived asset that, the longest-lived kind of asset that human beings own. Okay? Mm-hmm. And so when you have, um, when you have race or you know, discriminatory laws baked into housing policy, then by definition, that is a kind of bias that sticks around for a long time and becomes part of the system. Now, why is that important? That's important because if, if you say that um, you're going to throw someone in your vote, you're going to take a chance on this candidate, take a chance on, on that candidate. Well, when usually when people measure risk, they also think of risk in terms of well, what kind of cushion do I have if things go wrong. Now, since the end of World War II, what happened is we had essentially a system of land grants in this country. You were a GI, you came back from the war, you could get a very low interest or zero interest loan, you get set up in the house, now right away you've got equity. You let a few years go by, you make your payments, now you have equity to borrow against. Now maybe you can buy a second house, maybe you can start a business, you can leave something to your kids. These, these land grants, and I'm not saying that they were bad for the government to have given up, I'm just saying that they were off limits to black people. Mm-hmm. And what that meant has meant is that black neighborhoods have been systemically undercapitalized compared to white neighborhoods. Mm-hmm. Now, I want to be clear, nothing I say here should, should ever be taken to mean that there is any excuse for young black people not to, you know, get up every day and do their absolute best Absolutely. and walk right and talk right and live a virtuous life. I'm not making excuse number one. Mm-hmm. I'm just saying that when you're talking about a demographic and its political habits, you gotta frame those in the context of well, you know, what are they what are, what are the safety rails that they have to hold on to? You see what I'm saying? And so and yeah. so you're saying like grounded in some history and context. Exactly. That's right. And and so th- this means that, that it's, you have to look at the risk tolerance. You know, you, you're looking, you said correctly that people tend to vote in their interests. The first thing you have to ask is, well, how do people, how do people actually, um, how do they figure out what their interests are? You have to ask them. You can't tell them, you have to ask them. And this is one of the things I started to notice about the way lefties just talk about white people in the red states. They say, well, they're voting against their own interests. Well, no, no, don't, don't, say, don't say it like that. You haven't asked that guy in Appalachia, you know, or, or wherever. You haven't asked him what he thinks his interests are. Go and ask him. And then, you know, you can say, well, you're voting for this or that. Well, it's the same thing. It's like, you know, Republicans have not taken enough time to figure out what the risk tolerance in this demographic is. Well, first of all, even to figure out where the political center of gravity in that demographic is, you know. Because I feel like they, they look at what black Twitter has to say and they think that's black Americans. Like, come on, stop it. <laughs> so, Twitter, Twitter is not real life. Right. <laughs> it's not real life. Well, look, I think, look, I think the Democrats got caught up in that business too because they think, they think black Facebook and black Twitter is black America. And now look, their, their plan is backfire and, you know, whatever. Okay, but, <laughs> you know, mm. what is the, what is the, what is the, how, how does this demographic, how do people in this demographic calculate their own interests? What do they think their interests are? Uh, 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 what is their level of risk tolerance? You know, mm-hmm. and and to what do they aspire? And if and and then and then 
you have to do. You have to do all the work. I mean, that's just, you know, this is homework. Okay. So, and, and look, sometimes, and then you have to figure out, you know, this is, I, I'm asking very broad, very coarse grain questions, but this can get very fine grain. Because, for example, for, for many years, maybe it's a little bit less so now, because that, that old generation is dying out. But for many years, man, if you were a candidate and you were wrong on Cuba, like if you had anything nice to say about Castro, you were not going to get elected in the dog catcher in my hand. <laughs> What's going to happen? Okay? Mm-hmm. I'm not, now look, now you can say that's good, you can say that's bad, but that's just how it is. There was a, a, a demographic of people there who were single issue voters, and they were like, if, you, if I think you're any kind of a socialist, I'm not trying to hear it. Okay. So what I'm saying is, you know, we don't, we don't, uh, uh, we don't kind of, uh, you know, bemoan the idea that you have to go and appeal to that demographic in ways that that demographic will understand. You, you, we, we, don't, we don't have a problem with the idea that, listen, those guys, because they fled from Cuba, they're this and this and this. Okay. So you have to do the same thing with every other demographic. If you go to certain demographics in, in West Virginia, wherever else, and you're, and you're anti-coal, they're not going to like you. Okay. So I'm telling you, if, if you're trying to make headway in, 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 in the West Indian, community in, mm-hmm. in New York City, for example, mm-hmm. okay, and you're anti, and you know, it's a bunch of guys from, you know, from, from, from local four or five, and, 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 and what have you, you know, these uh, uh, carpenters unions, or the electrical union, whatever, and, and if you down on unions, they're not going to like you. That's it. Absolutely. Okay, so, so. Yeah, I, I get right, the, so, I, so that's all. I, don't, I don't mean to interrupt you real quick, but I, I mean, I, I get the idea no that, uh, you know, the party hasn't been or the parties, and just kind of speaking in principle, that if you don't appeal to the interest of the group that you're trying to get the vote of, that you're then, you know, you're obviously not going to get it. Um, I guess, but my right. question is like, what, it seems to me that if, if you agree with what I said earlier, that maybe Republicans are just watered down Democrats, they go to the same place, but at a slower rate, it, it seems weird to me that like, what, why vote Democrat then? Why not either not vote at all? Or, I mean, well, I guess that could be the only option, but like, I just don't see the incentive like, if, if the idea is that people are going to vote their interest, what is the interest in voting for the Democrat stuff that they don't like? If you, if you're a union person, and you and listen, if you have a mortgage and a family and a union job, mm-hmm. okay, and, and you think that this party wants to destroy all labor unions, huh? You're never going to vote for them. You're not. Correct. Right? Okay. <laughs> so, so, and by the way, I don't, I don't agree. I don't agree that, that, that they are the same or that they're, but no, it's, it, no. Listen, governments always tend toward the tyranny because that's the natural tendency of government. That doesn't mean Democrats are the same as Republicans. That's ridiculous. You know, there, there are definite, real, substantive differences. There are areas in which they can diverge. Well, of course there are because at the end of the day, you know, both, no matter who gets into the White House, that person's going to be running a bureaucracy. And bureaucracies tend to converge toward a certain form. That doesn't mean the political parties themselves are converging on a certain form. It just means that there's uncomfortable areas of overlap that we're keeping our eyes on. And you and I probably agree mm-hmm. that um, both of them show an unhealthy predilection toward foreign entanglements, okay, toward permanent war. Both mm-hmm. of them show an unhealthy predilection toward, toward you know, kind of a... a a kind of administrative busybody and what have you. We, we can talk about all that, and, and I'm with you there. Mm-hmm. But that, that's not the same thing. It's just insufficiently nuanced to say that they are the same. So, yes, if, if, if I were to accept the premise that the Republicans, the Democrats, are just a different form for the Republicans, if I were to accept that, then yes, by your logic, it would follow. But I don't accept that premise. Mm-hmm. So you still uh, like so you you uh, think that because I mean when I look at Congress I mean I think I see yeah. I see a spectrum I see like you have like a conservative like a Ted Cruz you have a Mitt Romney who is you know they're both Republicans but they're not the same uh, likewise you have uh, oh what's his name I can't think of his name but you know, like you know a more moderate Democrat and then you have AOC and it's like well they're very different as well yeah. even I mean even you can even compare like Nancy Pelosi to AOC like. They're they're not exactly the same Democrat either. So there is like this spectrum. But I just find even, you know, the, the conservatives that are who, you know, I should say the Republicans who are actually conservatives. I find that there's so few of them up there. And I find that the Republicans yes. are, like Mitt Romney are so are, are just honestly, I can't tell the difference sometimes between their policies. Well, this is this is something that I'm so glad you said this, because this, now this is something that I think. So, so, 
even though even though I disagree with that premise, mm-hmm. you're not you and you know your friends that you were talking to. You're not wrong to make that. It's not unreasonable that you made that inference. Okay, mm-hmm. and here is I think why because it's it's a theory that I've lately kind of I'm thinking about and kind of developing for a while, and I think it's I've been pounding on it and talking with other people about it. And I think it I think it kind of holds together, which is this that we have we have if not destroyed done a lot of damage to the actual uh, um, I want to say political diversity in America. We we've done real damage to what used to be an actual strain of liberalism mm-hmm. and what used to be an actual strain of conservatism in this country. And, and the event that is mostly responsible for that is Cold War. That's my theory. Hmm. When I, why do I say that? Because, you see, ordinarily, there's two things. One is that um, in an actual war, what happens is that you have that the the normal kind of conservative impulse um, to allow certain things to sort themselves out and to not interfere, you know, runs up against a hard reality. Well, actually, we do really need this many tanks and this many fighter planes and this much harder to work to this specification. And that's a hot war, right? But that's a kind of a war where where um, there is some kind of there is some whatever your political impulses are on the left or on the right, they are being checked by reality. Okay. And by the way, and that's certainly true in, in peacetime, really. It's, you know, you're going to have different political impulses, different parts of the spectrum, but they're more or less checked by reality. Now, we got into this very strange thing where we fought a shadow war for, like, what, 50 years? Okay. Now, here's the thing about, so, so the first thing that meant is that that threw off all our reflexes with respect to how we deal with political insurgency. And political insurgency is something that's native to us as Americans. Because one, we're a young country, and two, that's just the nature of, you know, we got 50 different governments. We are a country that, that's composed of, you know, many communities, many communities, what have you, and, and it's really a civic miracle that we hold together at all. But this means that political insurgency is just part of our thing. Now, ordinarily, okay, um, the number one rule for dealing with insurgency of any kind is not to overreact, okay? The British actually wrote the book on, they literally wrote the book on counterinsurgency. Hmm. The number one rule is do not overreact. Okay. Now, Here's the problem. When you're in a shadow war, okay, by definition, you're jumping in shadows. By definition, you can't get perspective on something because you don't know what it is, how big it is, how far away it is. Everything is in shadow. And we saw this. We saw that, like, the whole, even the whole moral calculus. By the way, another reason why I'm certainly me and a lot of other people I know really were turned off by Republicans. Um, you know, coming up because we saw how um, how the, the all that talk about liberty and this and that was just can't because when it came to certain when it came to, to, to regimes which were clearly doing a lot of dirt, they had nothing to say as long as those regimes were anti communist. Now again, I don't have I don't hold any brief for communism. You want to run your economy into the ground, that's your business. But at the same time, don't tell me that you're rounding up uh, uh, you're rounding up the you know, uh, dissidents who haven't blown anything up. They just have different ideas and you just putting them into gravy and that's mm-hmm. okay. You know, Republicans have a lot of shit to say about uh, Fidel Castro. I haven't heard one of them say anything bad about Augusto Pinochet. That's the problem. Mm-hmm. It means you're not trustworthy. And that I has see. Been, that, that's a moral problem. That's I a see. moral gap. And that gap was created in the Cold War. It was created in the Cold War where, like, anything was okay as long as you're anti and, and, you know, you can see right away that if you do this, you have a hyperpower with it, with, with unlimited money like the U.S. And so we will help you whatever you need as long as you're fighting communists. Well, yeah, some people really do need help fighting communists. And other people are going to game the system. Absolutely. They're going to be like, oh, shit, Washington, 
I mean, it's right here. Come on, I need some money. And, that, that's, and that's what you got. Okay. Now, mm-hmm. our political reflexes came out of that war destroyed. And what it meant was that we didn't have real conservatives anymore. We had was real liberals. That's interesting. Yeah, I, 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 I could see that. I mean, if you're not going to be ideologically... Yeah, because, oh, go ahead, sorry. No, I'm going to say that the, 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 look, the political left in America really did line up behind the socialists and the communists, and that's their problem. And, and um, you know, they, they, really, they really closed their eyes, and they got it wrong on some real serious problems with the Soviet regime, for one example. They did. They got it wrong, you know. Okay. But one problem is that the, the, the people who were arguing that free markets, that the free market is everything, that the free market is God, you know, their, their, their argument against command economies was so strident and so shrill that they didn't have to bother being correct. All they had to do was pose the thing. And so what you had was one dumb, lopsided political philosophy, for lack of a better term. I use the term charitably. Right? Help by the left, okay? Mm-hmm. It's leaning over to the 45 degree angle. It's going to fall over. But it's not falling over. Why? Because it's not a dumb, lopsided, stupid political ideology, which is held by the right, which is the market is God. Mm-hmm. Now, I mean, and, and they propped each other up, and they continue to do so to this day. Okay? Now, you know that as a real conservative, the market's not capable of destroying all kinds of things that conservatives find. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, you look at, like, yeah. prostitution, no. for example. I mean, sure, it's like in, in a exactly. free market economy, yeah, it'd be like, oh, buyer and a seller, right. mutually beneficial, da-da-da. But as a moral component, exactly. it's like, oh, no, that's, that's not, that's bad for both parties. Well, that's the thing. And, and so we haven't, in other words, what we have not done is gone back to the basics, back to the foundation, back to the roots. What is the root of our opposition to command economies? It's not that it's, it's not that government should regulate things. It's that the pricing system is a kind of it's it's like the internet. It, it, the, the pricing system is really a network like the internet, and it exists you know for the same reason to shuffle information around. What kind of information? The information on energy flows. How much energy it took to make things. Yes, supply and demand. Why command economies are that? Right, supply and demand. And this this is you know the, the famous uh, thing that uh, Milton Friedman did about uh, you know no one person can make a pencil. Right. Yep. This is really important, but it means, but it means that you, you can begin to have instead of, in other words, I guess what I'm saying is instead of jumping at shadows, instead of saying every goddamn thing is socialism, every goddamn thing is creeping Stalin, you can actually develop a real political philosophy and say, okay, look, you know, we're going to set the bar very high to where you know we, we don't believe in the government arbitrarily setting the prices of things. That doesn't mean we just out of hand reject the idea that a government can ever tell an industry not to do X. Come on. And so this is what we have with the health care debate. It's like, you know, I, I, I'm holding no beef for Obamacare or any other health care system. But goddamn, everybody knows the health insurance companies been getting away with murder forever. Everybody knows this. Mm-hmm. So don't bullshit me. Well, you know, I, now, what, oh, what the insurance is, to solve it, that's a separate question. I'm just, I'm just saying that you, you're less likely to get to the good, uh, proper instrument to solve this. And let's, let's, let's take you and I would probably agree that that, that instrument is going to involve elements of, of you know incentive setting, you know what I'm saying, mm-hmm. and, and private industry and that and 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 the private sector is very good at responding to demand. So I don't want to I don't want to pretend like like like, like we're going to just abandon our, our our capital, our market based or, or the, the, the market component of our principles. But but I'm just saying that the way we think about these problems, the way we think about them has been skewed because everything comes down to this kind of hysterical overreaction to the big red menace. And in the same way, by the way, that the way the left responds to things is like it's all out of proportion to what's actually happening. They're acting like every time the cops get into with somebody, they're, they're acting like it's 1954 Mississippi. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> yes. And it's like they have this epistemic template that they, they just lay over everything and then everything is like, no, it's not like that. Every conflict is not Vietnam, okay? Every Everything is not, is not Jim, every, 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 um, Every instance of police misbehavior is not Jim Crow. You know, 
know, mm -hmm. every bad president is not Hitler. Okay, so, and I'm saying, you and I can see clearly how the left is caught up with that set of templates. I'm saying that set of templates is something that's overlaid our entire mm -hmm. political culture, and it's damaged it to the point where we don't have real conservatives. What we have is neoliberal tax, and that goes for the yeah. Republican Party. It also goes for the Democratic Party. Yeah, and I what agree. I'd like to get us back to is a genuine and robust left, okay, that is also rooted in conservative principles, by the way, okay, and a genuine conservative right that's rooted in those same kind of principles of the eternal things, what have you. And until we get to that point, we're going to be, you know, we're going to waste a lot of energy trying to figure ourselves out. I, I know I've gone, I've gone on for a while, but that's, that's my half past theory. <laughs> <laughs> that's no, no, I think there's some, <laughs> definitely some elements of truth there. I mean, like when you bring up, uh, you know, the idea that, well, we're going to condemn Castro, but not Pinochet. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I mean, obviously, right. like, if you don't condemn tyranny, then, uh, I mean, you, you can't, you're, you're inconsistent, to say the least. Like, tyranny is tyranny no matter yeah. what. I mean, I don't, I'm not a fan of communism That's whatsoever. Right. Nevertheless, I mean, in America... If you want to be a communist and that's how you believe and you want to have little rallies and stuff, I mean, that's free speech. That's freedom That's freedom to, to exist, freedom to be, you know? Right. Um, and I'm right. all for that. Right. But as soon as it goes, as soon as you want to make, like, some policy changes and now you're saying, oh, well, government's now going to do this. We're going to change the purpose of government from this, this body that protects inalienable rights and property into a body that now provides services and it, it does this, it does all this stuff. No, no, no. That's where I have to put, you know, put an end to it. But, but yeah, no, I think there's a lot of... But here's the thing. Oh, go ahead. No, I was going to say, sorry, but I was going to say that, yes, uh, you know, but, but then we also have to... Look, you and I can agree at that thing. That... Um, kind of old-fashioned, kind of Catholic idea of subsidiarity, of decisions being made as close as possible to where the information is, um, it is a good thing. But it's also the case that if you're making the case for yourself as a political candidate or as a political party, then you also have to meet people where they are and you have to meet, the, meet reality where it is. And what I mean is that um, another... Um, is that the, the this thing that libertarians do a lot, which is that they act as if they kind of, kind of snap their fingers and just, you know, hit reset and let's just do this, you know. And this is, this is the thing that turns me off about libertarians, even as I acknowledged that they are correct to, to ask the question, why on earth is this the business of the state? You know, they're correct to ask that mm -hmm. question. And, and everyone who asked that, and, and, you know, again, as the more, the older I've gotten, the more I've seen of institutions, the more I'm like, you know, wait, wait, wait a minute. Hey, this guy, this is, someone voted for this guy. You know, who's deciding this? Why? You know, well, why, you know, a man doesn't become virtuous just because he gets elected to the political office. That's definitely true. Okay. But of course, it's also true that a man doesn't become virtuous just because he goes into business. Oh, yeah. But, you know, absolutely. Absolutely. The way we the way we distinguish between these two things, why should and, and again remember I'm not I'm not coming with prescriptions, actual positive prescriptions. I'm still in the realm of how we how we get a grip on these things so we can talk about them together, so we can reason about mm -hmm. them. And for example, you know, no one's really asking the question, why should at least not no one, but I don't hear enough people talking to, for example, young college students about why we shouldn't have the government do this, or why we should let the private mm -hmm. sector do that, and then how we how we moderate that. It's like the, the market is awesome. Don't be ridiculous. Come on. There's so I can think of half a dozen things. Credit, uh, you know, credit rating reform. Okay, you know, before before the, before the, the, the government said that. Listen, you have to if you're going to rate people's credit and pass information around about them. You gotta let them know what you're saying about them. You, you know, they ask mm -hmm. you, you have to tell them what they're credit rating. Now, there was no market impulse for experience trending all these credit uh, rating companies to be open and forthcoming about about their about their rating data, and they're still not open and forthcoming enough. Okay, but all, my, my point is just this: that 
that, that is a healthy tension between should the state do this or should private industry do this? But we have to get into more of the conversations, the, the, the provocations where a Ben Shapiro or a Milo will go and wind up these college students and say, okay, do you think government should do X? Okay, why do you think government should do X? And okay, well, here's what I think. Here's why this may be a bad idea. Here's what this can lead to. Here's how we can strike a balance. Um, when we're talking about you know, electing, uh, electing political leaders, well, the political leader has to actually manage the bureaucracy that's there. And what we've also found, by the way, is that we've had a rash of Republican leadership in the recent past that wanted to just hit reset on a whole lot of stuff and, and ended up doing a very bad job. Because, see, if you're really conservative, like I'm a Burkean conservative. I I believe you have to respect institutions, even if institutions need changing or need abolishing. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm an anti-revolutionary. Mm -hmm. And so I don't want to see conservatives coming up on a government like revolutionaries. You know, Ron Paul, who's an interesting character, okay? Mm -hmm. so someone asked him, what did you do with the Department of Energy? Get rid of it. What do you mean, get rid of it? The Department of Energy is responsible for all the stewardship of America's nuclear materials. Now, do they waste a lot of money? Yes, they waste a lot of money. But, but this is reality. This is like we have a lot. We have a, we have a, co a country that's a third of a billion people. We're going to do big things in the world. We're going to waste money. Now, we have to have a party that is always putting a downward pressure on the portfolio of things that the state asserts are its business. That's conservative. That's part of conservative. And that's Absolutely. Good. But at the same time, but at the same time, I'm hiring someone to run a bureaucracy. <laughs> that's it. And, and you've got to run the bureaucracy as if it matters. You don't kind of you know, kind of uh, uh, indiscriminately defund it and just fill it with political hacks because then you hope that people will lose faith in it and then it'll... That, that's, a, that, that's not a conservative way of shrinking government. Now, I don't have the answer, quote-unquote, to how to shrink government. I know we need to shrink it. I know it's got to spend less. I mm -hmm. know we have to live more within our means. But I also know that, like, there's certain stuff that you can't... I'm sorry, you can't do this. I'll give you another example. The post office. Why... Why are Republicans take the post office so much? Now, see, that does have a political and racial um, uh, set of rules. It does. And it's a problem. Because, again, a lot of people, a lot of black folks came up, okay, post, uh, uh, post World War II and post, uh, um, post Korea and Vietnam came up as, as postal workers. That was one thing that they could do. Say, listen, I, I don't know what to do with that, but, but ah, I can go work at the post office. And that was seen as a, a good and righteous thing. And people went and they, 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 didn't, they didn't become kind of a fifth column of holding the government. They got a postal or service job, and they went and bought a house in the suburbs, and they raised families. All the stuff that conservatives say they like. And, and, that, mm -hmm. and now that, that institution, which, by the way, uh, uh, unlike a lot of things the government does, the government at least has a constitutional remit to operate a postal service. Doesn't it, the, the Constitution doesn't say the government has to, mm -hmm. but the government is allowed to operate a postal service. Absolutely. And, and there's, a, there's a very good reason for, for us to operate a postal service. Because, because if, if, a, if a fundamental right of a, an American citizen is to petition his or her government, in a country the size of the United States, you can't effectively exercise that right without a postal service. So, how, so, so I'm t and I'm telling you, no one believes me, but I'm telling you that this, this turns black people, when, they, when black folks see how rapidly anti-postal service the Republican Party is, it turns them off. It turns me really? off. Really? Huh. Yes, I, I guess yes. my, let, me, uh, let me throw this at you and get your response to it. I think, for, at least from my end, the, the criticism of the post office specifically is that it's, you know, government doesn't have the proper incentives and constraints to run a business profitably. And therefore, any go any kind of business that they they get into, they just produce losses, which is bad for the economy. It's, it's bad for the business. allocation of scarce resources. And it, you know, based it's on that, those grounds alone, given that we have free markets that are doing the job much better, much more cheaply, you know, the the idea is maybe back in the day, sure, there might have been legitimate reasons to have that. But do we really need it today? I beg your pardon. The post office, the postal service, is not a business. It's the postal service. Exactly. I mean, look, oh, but on, but it, I, no, I, I agree. It's, it's not. It's not. I mean, it can't be a business it's not, because it doesn't. It doesn't. It's not the right. Yeah. My, my point is, it's not supposed to be run like a business. It's supposed to be run efficiently. But efficiency isn't. Listen, listen. I'm a software developer. 
I've been in the industry mm-hmm. for over 25 years. <laughs> Government doesn't have a monopoly on inefficiency. <laughs> okay, <laughs> like, like the private sector is plenty inefficient. The reason the reason we tend to prefer private sector solutions is, of course, because if if a, if a business, a privately owned business, is inefficient enough, it'll go out of business, and that's the yeah, end. Yeah, the losses are sustained by the, yeah, 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 they're limited to the person who the sustained them. Taxes and, uh, well, right. Okay. So, so you know, I'm 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 a big fan of the private sector, but let's not fool ourselves. You know, this is it. It is simply not true that that only the private sector can do things efficiently. Not well, profitably, I would okay. say. No, I mean, an efficiency is a well, part of that well, equation. Yeah. Well, again, but okay, is a, is the fire department supposed to be profitable? Profitable? Uh, is the fire department supposed to be profitable? No, uh, probably not. I mean, I'm not <laughs> saying all services, but I'm saying like, you know, and I've seen any, and let me, let me put it this way. Obviously any yeah. government thing where you have a Congress or a president, you know, all these things, it's going to be a draw on the economy. Like I'm not going all the way to like anarchism where we just don't have any government at all. And that way right. people have, you know, right. full control of all of their money. Um, now, even the Constitution establishes a government. It establishes powers that government has. It establishes legitimate purpose, you know, legitimate functions and purposes of government that are going to require revenue. Um, Correct. And, and, you know, I think to whatever extent we can, I think we, you know, if we can limit government within a more reasonable way, I think we should definitely do that. Um, Absolutely. And I, and I, and I, I it just seems... Yeah, it just seems, you know, yeah, I agree. Yeah, obviously it's, uh, and I have to do more research on it. I'm sure there are good reasons why they wanted the the post office uh, to be a federal power. Um, But it seems, you know, on one hand, we say that most black Americans self-identify as conservatives or moderates. But then at the same time, you're saying that they are not, like, they're kind of very upset about the idea of getting rid of the post office, which kind of, you know, if done correctly, could be a real conservative uh, idea. But go, go ahead. No. No, 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 no. I didn't say they, they self-identify. I said they are conservative. It's a difference. Oh, well, yeah, I'm just going by kind of some of the polling that I've read. Okay, I see what you mean, yeah. But, yeah. but yeah, they are, I'd say they are conservative, but here's the thing. Gotcha. Um, you have to remember that, that especially older black folks, um, you know, historically, um, historically, black folks, black Americans have been one of the demographics that helped improve America by appealing to its own founding principles. The, that, that's a very, that, that's a thing that's, that's the opposite of, of revolution, right? It's, it's, it's evolution. Yeah, it's restoration. It's, like, it's restora- there you go. It's restoration, mm-hmm. right? And really all the best, all the best political operators in history, uh, all, all the best, um, uh, 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 Fighters for 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 the soul of humanity in history. All of the best people have 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 been kind of have operated in that spirit. Okay, I mean, right back to Christ Himself. Now, um, so there is nothing particularly conservative about dismantling a government service because conservatism. Hmm properly understood has nothing to do with whether or not the government should run a service. You see, when we talk about liberalism, economic liberalism, we're going back to even before Hayek, who I'm always quoting, Mm -hmm. but you could go back to the fight in England over the corn laws, you know, whether prices should be allowed to fluctuate or whether they can. Okay. Now we tend to take an absolutist view of this. But, you know, if, if, if you just look at the history of Europe or the history of uh, even the history of the city of London, you know, going back to the first century A.D., um, you see right away that, that you don't always have the luxury of letting prices fluctuate wildly in an atmosphere of an environment of agricultural uncertainty. We think now that it's insane for, for the U.S. government to, to, to put price controls on things like peanuts and sugar and corn and what have you. Yes. But we can say that we can see that it's insane in an environment of radical abundance. 
this radical abundance that we human beings enjoy as a matter of, you know, agricultural reality, mm -hmm. that condition came into being like five seconds ago in historical terms. Yes, you're right. You see what I'm saying? Oh, yeah. And so, okay. And, and so, and so if, you, if you look at you know, the, the European monarchs, again, from before the Roman Empire, right up to and past the Peace of Westphalia, all these kings had to, had to, you know, figure out, okay, well, I can't let the price of this get too high because it means the price of bread is going to do this and the price of this. Okay, now, were they not conservative? Were these monarchs not conservative? Were they bleeding heart liberals? Some of them were ridiculous. They were just <laughs> trying to figure out how not to have the whole thing explode on them. But you see, we now we're sitting on top of a civilization where, again, we have radical food abundance, we have radical energy abundance, and we have radical specialization. And what that means is that we can allow things to, to, to fluctuate and what have you, and it's okay, and we should, because if you try to do those same kind of controls on an economy like this, it will be a disaster. Mm -hmm. but, but again, you see what I mean about going back to the roots? Like, like why do we, you know, in other words, I don't, I don't want people to, to become less conservative. I don't want people to suddenly jump on board with all these, uh, you know, bright ideas about how government should do this and that and everyone should pay for this. No, I don't mm -hmm. want that. You know, but, you know, we've, we've gotten away too long with this reflexive opposition to the government shouldn't do this because whatever. It's only ridiculous. The government needs to operate prisons. The government has to be the only party that Ooh. operates prisons. This is, this is very important. The, any penal system you have has to be operated by the government, end of story. That is fundamental to democracy. In the same way that, by the way, punishment for crimes is fundamental to a pluralistic, a pluralistic democracy. You can't, the whole, thing, the whole thing falls apart if government doesn't punish. And I can talk about why in a second. But the point is that there are some things that are not supposed to be like this. And I think it's fine for us to say the post office can't be one of those things. If compared to the shit we've been spending money on, it doesn't cost that much. And it's in the Constitution. And it's jobs. And if we fund it right, it will be a jobs program, like a real jobs program. Other, hmm. other developed Western countries love their postal system. Why can't we? Why can't we take pride in this piece of infrastructure that we built? This is a miracle. I used to go out with a girl from another country. She, she, uh, she was from uh, Italy. She said, this, this postal thing this is amazing. You, you, got, you don't realize how messed up it is in other parts of the world. Like you can put a, a check, you can put money in a metal box on the side of the street, and it gets where it's going across the country. It's a miracle. Mm -hmm. Let there be one thing that we built together as Americans, and it is ours as Americans. The pri there's plenty of stuff for the private sector to do. There's and by the way, by all means, God bless FedEx and, and, uh, and UPS and whoever else wants to get in the game. Wonderful. Fund the post office. Fund the goddamn post office. You're funding all types of shit on the other side of the planet, okay? Mm -hmm. When you dump into a, a 2,000 year old blood feud between two strains of Islam, you can fund the goddamn post office. We can do that. We can afford that. The other stuff, yeah, cut that. <laughs> <That's fine. laughs> you know. Interesting. I've never, <laughs> you know? I've you never know? heard a passionate defense of the post office like this before. <laughs> we need. We, you know why? Because we need at least one thing. Seriously, we need. We need at least one thing. This can't. It can't be the case that everyone's talking about markets. Markets are wonderful. Markets are an instrument. They're a tool. But but there's something. Listen, man. We have to also. If we follow this kind of, it's almost like just wrestling with these lefties. We end up talking about thing, about people, and about life, and about the country in the same kind of materialistic, mechanistic, kind of dry, dead, soulless way that they that they talk about it. And I don't want that. This is ours. This is our post mm -hmm. office. It's beautiful. It belongs to us. It's part of our history. It's the thing we built. And and anywhere you, if you have an address, we can get you mail. That's amazing. That's it is. a country this size. That is phenomenal. You know, and and you know something, um, it's it's right for us. In, in other words, look, I have I have been very vocal about the, the importance of defending monuments, even mm -hmm. monuments that that dumb lefties assert are racist. I, was, I don't care if it's a racist monument. Hands off the monument. Like we won't have you pulling down a statue in the middle of the street just because you decide it's got to go down the memory hole. You want to preserve okay, the now, history. I think, 
I want to preserve the history, and and if and I want to preserve the process, which is if you really think this statue should not be on that plinth, then you have to do that the old-fashioned way. You've got to convince enough of us. Mm-hmm. You just go in the middle of the night with your friends and pull it down. It's like no, 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 hands off, no, and and I don't care. Yes, yes, so and so was a racist. Yes, he was. Hands off the fucking statue. That's one. Okay. Now most conservatives, most Republicans would agree with me on that. But again, we seem awfully wobbly when it comes to preserving anything that's, that's an actual living institution. Hmm. And we have to understand that like, if conservatism is a political idea or, or a political stance that is rooted in gratitude, and I think it is, and I'm, I'm cribbing from Roger Scruton, but that's my three words, you know, a uh, uh, kind of summary of conservatism, start with gratitude. Mm-hmm. Then, then, then I have to say that, that too many Republicans and too many conservatives don't start with gratitude when it comes to actual, the actual civic institutions, even though those institutions spend money. Yes, we should always be pinching pennies. Yes, there's always better ways to do things. But stop acting like every, it's, it's a hard, it's the worst thing in the world, the government is spending money on, on X. You know, be grateful. That, I'll give you an example. Like, everyone likes to complain about the DMV. And there are things to complain about in the DMV. But we have two different DMVs in this country, and some work better than others. And I, as mm-hmm. a conservative, am grateful that I live in a country where when you walk into the DMV, you ain't special. It doesn't matter who you are. In other countries, there are places in the world now where if you go in their DMV and you look like the guy whose face is on the coin or someone recognizes you, oh, you're so-and-so. Oh, no, you come this way. You, you know, you get the special thing and you don't have to, oh, yes, sit right here, blah, 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 blah. In our, in our rambunctious American system, doesn't matter who the hell, hey, yo, take a number and go wait on the goddamn line there. Fill out that form. You think that applies even to, like, you know, state assemblymen and governors? You don't think they get special treatment? I don't. I can't imagine that state. Well, first of all, I can't imagine state assemblymen going to the DMV. I suppose that they They'd send his assistant. Uh, you're right. Well, they <laughs> they send the assistant, right. But, but even so, like, the assistant got away. I mean, yeah, yeah. That was, when you do, there are all these things. What I'm getting at is there's all these things in, in, in American civic life that... Yeah, they're not, as, they're not as efficient as they could be. And yeah, they're a pain in the ass. But, like, they work. It doesn't mean that you should keep them forever. It doesn't mean you shouldn't examine them. But Jesus Christ, you know, usually in this country, the cops pull you over, man, and, and it's like they don't want to hear shit about money. That's like, hey, you were speeding, here's a ticket. Mm-hmm. That, you know, let's be grateful for that. Do you see what I'm saying? Yeah, Be grateful no, for the working, and I, I, know, I never, I never hear Republicans express gratitude for civic institutions like that. They, they, they express gratitude for the Constitution, mm-hmm. but that's a very dry kind of gratitude if it doesn't extend to being grateful for things and institutions. Outside of the police and firefighters, police and firefighters are great. Those only unions Republicans like. Every other union is terrible, according to them. Well, that's also a problem. It's a mm-hmm. right? So, so this is what I'm saying. Like, I'm I'm pushing for a, like a, a different kind of spirit that, on the one hand, is trying to get to the bottom of things, the root, the foundation, and that's neither that should be neither properly understood a leftist thing or a right wing thing, because when you walk into a building. You don't look, if you look to the left or look to the right, you're not going to find the foundation. You've got to look down. Mm-hmm. So I'm, I'm, mm. I'm pushing for this, uh, another way of understanding ourselves as Americans and understanding what we are actually standing on. So that if we want to build something, if we want to dismantle something, if we want to change something, if we want to evolve the structure, we're doing so from, from a radical, radix root, from a root level understanding of where we're at. And we're not, and, and listen, the left definitely isn't doing that, but neither is the right. Yeah, and no one's paying right. attention to that right now because the left, the left is so crazy, they're burning the goddamn place down. So, of course, <laughs> they have their problems to be dealt with. Yeah. They're, they're not concerned right. about the foundation. They're concerned about burning it to the ground right now. Burning it to the ground, exactly. Yep. So, okay, so we got to deal with that. And, and listen, they can be handled very easily because they're not, you know, they're a pure cotton candy. The problem is that the mayor and the government are holding back. That's what it is. We know 
this. We know. Come oh, on. Come yes. on. Really? Really? Yep. No, no. It's beautifully <laughs> said. <laughs> yeah, I mean, listen. listen the, the, the Democratic leaders, you know, decided that they were going to try to hang this around Trump's neck. They said they were going to pull back. They figured that he, they were counting on an overreaction from, from, from the federal government, right? And then they could show, oh, look at Trump. He's, he's you know, whatever. They're roughing up our kids in the streets. Da, 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 and they'd hang there on his neck come November. And I have to say that for an impulsive character like he is, he played that perfectly. He followed the first rule of counterinsurgency. Do not overreact. And he didn't. And now they're screwed because as far as I can uh, see, the, di- the violence is not dying down in places where they haven't cracked down on it. The police, the local police forces have lost confidence in, the, in, in, the, in their political leaders. And now if they do ask Trump for help, um, well, he'll be delighted to help them. But now he goes into the, in November having helped these guys out yeah. and having solved the problem. Yeah, he's the hero. So, I mean, yeah, exactly. Which, you know, I mean, l- listen, they deserve what they get because they shouldn't have played politics with something this important. This is the ba- this is basic. This is basic yeah. public order. I agree. I agree entirely. But, but it, Oh, sorry, I know I know I went on for a while, but I, just, I, just, I don't <laughs> often get to say that it's not loud. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, it's been great. No, I, 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 you know, the purpose of having you on is to, you know, I, I, I can listen to myself talk all the time, but no, I like having other people on and getting perspectives and hearing, you know, theories and stuff. That's, you know, that's the purpose of the podcast. I think that's a good place to wrap it up here for today. Um, do you have any other final thoughts? Are you, are you going back on Censor.TV anytime soon? Has that been scheduled? Or are you not allowed to tell? That has not been scheduled. <laughs> no, I, I don't. Please, um, <laughs> I scheduled. Um, <laughs> I think. Um, l- listen, I I I would debate Milo uh, anywhere, anytime. And and for the record, um, even though I think he's wrong about a great many things, I think he's he's wrong in his approach. He's not. He is not. I, I don't. I don't perceive that he has um, like ill will in his heart. Mm-hmm. That way. I just think he's. I think you just have some disagreements with them. Like, I mean, I I have some disagreements with you. I definitely disagreements with pretty much everyone that I've ever listened to. But it's like, that doesn't mean that we can't discuss or talk or, I mean, go to the bar, have some beers. I mean, you know, there's there's a very human element that is lost in in politics. And I'm just trying, you know, I think like you, I'm trying to get some of that back to some degree. That's correct. Well, I'll leave you with I'll leave you with this, because um, this is something that uh, I think think you'll appreciate is, you know, when we're talking about dialogue. So, um, um, in, so at a certain point, um, AT&T, which used to have the monopoly on, on America's, uh, telephone lines, AT&T got it to where the, the quality of the circuits was so good that people didn't, people would kind of halt their own conversations in the middle and say, hello, 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 because the line was so quiet that the line was dead. And so AT&T introduced, they came up with this basically a psychoacoustic solution to the problem. It's called comfort noise. Comfort noise was just they injected a little bit of static into the line. That's all. Mm-hmm. And that little bit of low-level noise in the phone line allowed people to be confident that they were occupying the same space with the other conversant. That were stated that the, the noise itself, of course, by definition being noise, didn't have any informational content. It was just to assure people that, yeah, we're, we're really talking. Okay. Hmm. One of the things I would say is that we, we should be better. As, if we're trying to convince people, especially young people, if the people who are, who have habitually not voted Republican or not really thought deeply about conservative ideas, then I think one of the things. Uh, we need to get good at is making comfort noise. Is saying things that reassure people that we are really in the same room and we're really talking about the same thing. And that means, one of the things that means is, for example, giving up a lot of the platitudes that we tend to utter that don't really mean anything, mm-hmm. or that worse yet, kind of go against kind of known consensus reality. And sometimes it can be it can be difficult to get uh, conservatives to make comfort noise, especially when you have crazy lefties screaming all kinds of abuse. And what you want to do is you just want to scream the opposite abuse. So like America is terrible. America is the best country ever and has always stood for liberty. Well, neither of those things is true. And by the way, that's not why you should love and defend America. But I don't love my country because.
because she's perfect. I mm-hmm. love her because she's my home. All right? And that's, well, very, so. and that's the only reason I need. And, 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 like, and, and so that's, that's what I'll leave you with, is, is that if, if we can get down to, to, to basics, if we can go back to foundational principles, uh, then, then maybe we can, we can kind of muster the courage of our convictions to admit shortcomings, right? And to kind of, to kind of reassure our opponents that no, we're, we're, we're talking about the same thing. We have this thing in common. Mm-hmm. And then kind of, you know, what are we gonna build on top of this foundation? So Absolutely. that's it. I, I agree with all that stuff, all great stuff. Carver and Mike, thank you so much for coming on. We'll definitely have you on again. And uh, till next time, guys. Hey, thanks, guys. Appreciate it.